And now, Mike Gillich, owner of the Tigers and former minor league shortstop for the Tigers. Mike, do I have it right that as a kid growing up in Detroit, you shag fly balls for Hank Greenberg in the mornings around the ballpark? You got it right, Joe. Uh, I was very lucky. The school principal and uh, two Tiger scouts at that time, uh, Wish Egan and uh, Denunzio, uh, arranged it. And I used to get down there a couple of times a week, and that was a big thrill. The only thing I was dumbfounded, though, that he couldn't get the ball past the apron of the infield when the initial pitchers were throwing the first five or six balls that were hit. And lo and behold, I knew they were kind of dark looking, and I asked him, I'm wondering why they're darker. I did notice they were darker. Picked up a few, they're kind of heavy. But they turned out to be waterlogged balls, and he progressed. As, as, uh, uh, he had three sets of balls. He had the waterlogged, and he had a ball that wasn't quite as bad, and then uh, the good balls. And my goodness, when they start going in the upper deck, uh, you know, I said, that's Hank Greenberg. I've been watching since I've been a little baby. Did you ever play in Tiger Stadium? Yeah, I played in Tiger Stadium, Joe, uh, uh, with the uh, All-Star Fireman Midgets team when I was uh, 12 years old. And that was a lot of fun and a big thrill. And that's why I always respond to people that want to try to use the stadium or to get kids out there. Or, or I felt good about uh, when we came up with the idea of running the bases at Tiger Stadium. Uh, Give everybody a chance to just run around the dear girl, you know. Did you ever hit a ball in the upper deck? No, I never got close, Joe. <laughs> All right. Uh, Mike, before you bought the club, uh, what was your favorite memory of Tiger Stadium? Well, my favorite memory was uh, uh, watching the Cubs and the Tigers in the uh, 45 World Series. And uh, that was a big thing, you know, to skip school in those days. I mean, they were very, very strict. And uh, uh, you knew that, you know, you were very nervous when you did that. And... Uh, but it was one of the biggest thrills of my life because just lived uh, in a neighbor, blue-collar neighborhood with a playground close by, and first 15 years of my life, that's that's where everything revolved. So anytime you could get a streetcar and go downtown to Trumbull at the corner and watch a ball game, especially World Series, it was a huge thrill for me. A tremendous impact on me. We all remember how Mickey Lolich won those three games in the 1968 World Series and led the Tigers to victory over the St. Louis Cardinals. Mick, you had a long career in Detroit, 1963 to 1975, and you certainly accomplished an awful lot. What's your feeling about Tiger Stadium? Well, first off, Tiger Stadium is the first uh, Major League Baseball park that I ever walked into or saw in my whole lifetime. Uh, I saw the, the Angels, not the Angels, but the Dodgers and the Giants play in Old Seal Stadium out there in the Pacific Coast League area before they you know, became a major league, I mean, they were major league teams, but they are playing in a minor league park. So I had never seen a major league park. And lo and behold, when I got called up from Syracuse, uh, the Tigers were at home. And so when I walked into Tiger Stadium, it was my first sight of a major league ballpark. And it was sort of overwhelming because it's, you know, it's a big park with a tremendous amount of seats and totally enclosed almost. And uh, it was quite an impression to me. It was like, wow, you know, <laughs> this is nice. <laughs> but uh, Tiger Stadium meant a lot to me. I mean, I, I spent my whole career there, I mean, as, as, as a Tiger. And, you know, it, it was an old lady, I'll admit it. And, uh, but it was sort of, it was a neat ballpark. I mean, I, I traveled all around the American League, and I also played in the National League for three years. And, Tiger Stadium is just one of those very unique ballparks. I have never ran into a single player who said they hated the ballpark. Uh, all the American League players enjoyed playing there because they always talked about hitting because it was such a, a great place for hitters to see. And I can honestly say that uh, being I pitched in the American League and the National League, as a pitcher, it was the hardest park to pitch in in the big leagues. Uh, I, you know, I was a left-hander and I pitched in Fenway Park and I didn't have a lot of trouble in Fenway Park because you could set hitters up and do certain things to them. But in Tiger Stadium, they always talked about the swirling winds and, you know, the overhang and that type of stuff. And, I mean, you could throw a perfect pitch on a guy and jam him on the fist and he'd pop it out towards left field and the darn thing would fall in the first row all the time. And uh, it, it was a tough park to pitch in, but it was still my home and really enjoyed playing there. You know, in Detroit, uh, you won 18 games, you won 19 games, you won 22 games, and you won 25 games. But to me, uh, I never saw anybody in Detroit, Jack Morris, uh, Jim Bunning, uh, Denny McLean, uh, even Denny. I never saw a guy have a season like you had in 71. You won 25 games, you lost 14. But, Mickey, you pitched 300 
and 76 innings and 29 complete games. 29 complete games is, is, a, is a whole decade for the Tigers staff today. How do you do 29 games? Is that just how the game was played then? But that's by today's standards, and it, it, it's just a, an incredible number of games to complete. Well, it all comes down to that uh, it was the first year that Billy Martin became the manager of the Tigers, and uh, he called me down to downtown Detroit to the old Sheridan Cadillac to have lunch with him during the winter, and he says, you're not going to believe this, but I'm going to tell you something right now. He says, when you start a ball game, he says, you are going to stay in the ball game until the seventh inning. He says, you're the best pitcher I got. He says, you're the best. He says, you're better than what I got out there in the bullpen. And he says, I am not going to take the ball away from you. He says, the first seven innings belong to you come hell or high water. And I mean it. Well, you know, a lot of managers tell you this kind of stuff. But I remember I was pitching in a ball game, and I was down four to nothing in the second inning. And I looked over towards the bench, and Billy was standing there with his arms folded looking out at me. I looked at the bullpen. Nobody's warming up. I finally got out of the inning. I came back in, and he says, what were you looking at? And I says, well, I said, you know, I really don't have too good of stuff out there today. He says, I told you, this game is yours till the seventh inning, and you better, better bear down. I actually came back and won that ball game, and he set the mode for me right there. I knew that I had to pitch the first seven innings of the game no matter what the score was, and in return, he put a vote of confidence into me that I wasn't looking over my shoulder all the time to see if somebody was warming up because I had a runner on first and third and nobody out. And I'd, I maybe I'd, you know, I'd give up one run that inning, but it was only one run. And I had a pretty darn good year that year as far as earned run average. And usually when I went to the seventh inning, I had a lead. And that's why I ended up pitching 29 complete ball games. You know, today uh, the standard, I think, is to pitch 200 innings. They, 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 they get these ball players, these pitchers, uh, and they know they're only going to pitch six or seven innings. And if you can make 200 for the season, it's a good season. But 376 innings, I never saw you have a sore arm. If you had one, you hit it. Oh, no, Joe. I, I never did have a sore arm. Uh, you know, the good Lord gave me a great arm. I mean, sure, it got tired sometimes. But as far as having any injury in there that prevented me from throwing, uh, I never had it. And, you know, I pitched 376 innings that year, but I also pitched 300 the next inning year. I, I pitched 300 innings for four consecutive years. And, uh, you know, <laughs> a lot of people don't do that anymore. And uh, anymore, I don't know who's done it. Uh, the only thing that irritated me about the whole thing was I pitched 376 innings. I set an American League record, a sort of a modern day record. And the next year, Wilbur Wood pitched 376 and one third inning. <laughs> <laughs> All right. A favorite memory about Tiger Stadium. Maybe it was game number five, the 68 series, or whatever. Do you have a favorite? Well, I do, but it, it really has nothing to do with the game, so I don't know if you want me to tell you about it or not. But well, As long as it's clean, Mickey, you oh, go yes. ahead. Yes, I, I was, uh, one day we were taking batting practice. It was uh, a Saturday game. It was going to be a Saturday evening game, and I was standing out by the left field scoreboard, the one that sat down on the ground. And through the course of batting practice, as I was standing down there, uh, I was unscrewing the light bulbs in the scoreboard, and I actually got all of them. And here, <laughs> here comes game time, and they throw on all the scoreboard lights, and this one scoreboard wouldn't light, you know. So I was talking to, uh, oh, I can't think of his name right now, who was like the, st the stadium manager was Ralph Snyder at the time. So they, they get the electrician in the ballpark. And they run down and they, they, check all the, they check all the circuit breakers and everything and everything. And it's like, why isn't the scoreboard working? And they scuffled with it for about two innings. And finally, they you know, couldn't figure it out. So they called in Detroit Edison. They had to bring in a specialist. And the specialist comes in. And they're you know, checking everything. And the guy is, you know, is there a switch out on the scoreboard? Uh, uh, yeah, there's a switch out there. And so between innings, the guy runs out there. He checks the switch. It's in the on position. He comes back in. He says, I can't figure out what's wrong with that scoreboard. He says, everything is testing fine. And finally, uh, John Kosovac, he was the, the, the maintenance guy there. He says, you know, he says, during batting practice, he says, I saw Lolich standing out by the scoreboard. And they says, well, what's that got to do with it? He says, well, you know, he's always up to something. 
he says, do you think he unscrewed the light bulbs? And they says, oh, he couldn't have unscrewed the light bulbs. There's too many of them. And so between innings, they went out there and they turned the first light bulb and guess what? It came on, you know? <laughs> well, anyway, <laughs> it came down to me a couple of days later, you know, that the, actually I talked to Jim Campbell later and he says, do you know how much it cost us to bring that guy in from Detroit Edison on a Saturday and off day? We had to pay him triple time to come in. He says, it cost us a fortune. And I says, well, that's the way it goes, Jim. And he says, you know, that's one of the best practical jokes I ever saw. And he says, I do appreciate it. <laughs> you know, Mick, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about your three victories in the 68 series. I know you've been over it. It's why you're so acclaimed and why people remember you so well. But that game five in Detroit, we can talk about the two in St. Louis, but that is in St. Louis. Tell me about game five, what that was like. You had to stay alive. You had to win that game. You were down three games to one to the Cardinals. And you and K-Line did it. Well, that game was, you know, the, the pivotal game in the World Series, really. We all know that. And I have a good memories about that ball game. And, I mean, a lot of them are not what you'd think they'd be. Uh, for some reason, Johnny Sane, my pitching coach, and myself uh, forgot about pregame ceremonies that go through. I mean, neither one of us, you know, remembered. I mean, under the stress, the pressure, I don't know. I had a routine that I always went through that I would – go down to the bullpen, uh, you know, like 15 minutes before game time. And I would throw X amount of warm-up pitches, which generally took me about 12 minutes. I'd take 12, 12 minutes to warm up for a ball game. And then I'd walk back to the dugout and I'd be ready to go. Well, as I start my warm-ups, uh, the bullpen's in the shadows at that particular time of year in October. I get almost halfway through my warm-up, if I get that far, and all of a sudden, we're going to do the national anthem, which is right in the middle of me warming up. And if you remember, Jose Feliciano did a rendition of the national anthem that lasted a long, long time. All of a sudden, you know, that's over. I have totally cooled down, and now I start throwing again. And they're doing the meeting at home plate and all that type of stuff, and the umpire comes down to me and he says, you know, he says, you got to go, Mick. We got to get out and get out, get the game started. And I says, I'm not even ready to pitch. He says, look at it. He says, we're on national television. We got to go. We got to go. He says, take some extra warm up pitches out there on the mound. Well, I, I went along with it because he was so demanding. And when I went out there on the mound, I, I hadn't even thrown a breaking ball yet. And I continued to throw nothing but fastballs to get loose. And in the first inning, I gave up the three run home run to. Uh, Orlando Cepeda, and he's a dead fastball hitter, and basically I was pitching right to his power, and you know we're down three runs in the first inning, and it wasn't until like the second inning or even into the third inning that I finally started throwing some breaking balls, and now I was in my groove, I was pitching well, but I was behind in the ball game, and I was sort of worried about it, and then when that line drive went to left field, that uh, who hit it? I don't remember right now. That uh, as soon as the ball was hit, I says, "Uh oh, I'm out of here." And Willie came up with probably the greatest play of his career: that one hopper into freehand that tagged Brock out. And when he tagged Brock out, I mean, I said, "Gee, I'm still alive." And got out of the inning, and you know, Mayo came to me and he says, "You okay?" And I says, "Yeah." I says, "I'm doing fine." And then we got into the instant. Uh, what was it? The sixth inning, I guess. I don't remember when. Gates Brown should have pinched hit for me. I mean, everybody knows that Gates Brown should have pinched hit for me. I mean, I went up in the on-deck circle, had my jacket on and everything, and uh, I looked over, and Gates is getting his bat. He's doing the whole thing, and all of a sudden, the out is made in front of me, uh, and I turn around and look back towards Mayo, and Mayo motioned me towards the plate. And I'm figuring, well, okay, Gates isn't ready yet. You know, something's happened. So I take my jacket off. I go up to the plate. I look back, and Mayo is signaling me to get in the batter's box. Well, the first pitch comes across the plate, and I look back at Mayo again, and he says, stay in there. And I'm like, what's going on here? You know, and I hit that little dead bird base hit into right field, which, and I eventually came around and scored the tying run to make the game 3-3. Three to three. k -Line drove me in. And so that was quite a game, that fifth game. <laughs> the one, the only, the original Sparky Anderson. Manager, you were there for 17 years. Your feelings about Tiger Stadium? The funny part about this, Joe, and, and it, it lasts with me every time, even when I come to Detroit and I go by the stadium, just go by it, 
I have the same feeling. That, to me, on Trumbull Avenue, when you come up off of Trumbull and you look at that stadium, and just think about it, look above the stadium and see how high the lights are, and you say to yourself, that is what major league ballparks look like. They are not ballparks that we're building today, Joe, that are put together with five and six different elements to try to make it look old. This stadium is there. That is what Major League Baseball is. And the difference, one of the bigger differences in Tiger Stadium than all the other ones other than Yankee Stadium, they got to see really and truly Babe Ruth was out there, Lou Gehrig was out there, Ty Cobb was out there, K-Line was out there. You start naming the people that put their foot on those grounds. And I want to tell you one thing. That stadium, to me, they ought to take the most beautiful aerial view. They've had them, I know that. But they ought to shoot it and shoot it till they get the perfect, perfect aerial view because that's what the major leagues was all about. You know, manager, wasn't it a fact that the fans were so close to the field that that created a kind of intimacy that you don't get in an awful lot of stadiums? Absolutely. You're above our dugout, as you know, because where you guys sit in the press box, you know, above our dugout is that overhang. And if you come out to the front of the dugout where the steps are, they can scream down at you. <laughs> And Roger Craig used to say to me, don't step out there. The boys are hostile. And I would go out there. He said, don't do that. I said, Roger, let them have their say. And they said things, Joe, that the Marines don't do in the foxhole. <laughs> and it, it, was, it was marvelous. Tell me from your viewpoint, Gibson's home run. Well, I think everybody must put it in. And you're a writer, so you understand it. People should put his home run in the right perspective. Yes, it was a home run that finished it off, no question. But they must go back on this young man's career and find out how many guys have hit that many big game winning home runs for Detroit. I managed 26 years, Joe. And I had some great players in Cincinnati. I would not take a thing away from any of them. But I never had a player win more big games than Kurt Gibson with a home run. All right, back to the ballpark for a minute. Tell me about life in that dugout, because you used to tell me you'd hide behind the post to give you signs, and you'd be spitting out those sun seeds. Give me a sense of, of, of life in that dugout for 17 years in Detroit. Well, first of all, thank God I was little. <laughs> because the big guys always bump their heads. And I didn't have to worry about bumping my head. I could do anything I want. But, like you said, the pillars were great things for a manager because I was able to work, like, on the middle of the pillar was one thing, on the right of the pillar is another thing, on the left of the pillar was another thing. So I could work the pillar for, say, three nights against... Uh, <laughs> Uh, Boston. Now somebody else come in, I could go in and, and they could see from the coaching box the steps. I could work the steps, but you couldn't see them from over there. I could have one right foot up on a step. That was the bun. I could have the left foot up. That was the steal. I could have both feet and lean against the post. That was the hit and run. So you were able to do, without doing all that other stuff, you were hidden from them because that field has a slope to it. We now give you the fox, Jim Northrup, whose triple off Bob Gibson gave the Tigers the 1968 World Series. Forgive his dog for getting into the act. He couldn't help himself. Jim, you played uh, 10 years for the Tigers from 64 to 74, and you did something that few players ever did. You played right field, center field, and left field. And, you know, I just like your perspective on what it was like playing there and what that ballpark meant to you. Well, you know, when I was a kid and came to Tiger Stadium, it, uh, the, uh, I had seen some games because Ted Williams was my favorite player. My dad used to bring me down once a year 
to see Ted play, but you know that was a five and a half hour, six hour trip. There were no expressways. From where? From uh, St. Louis, Michigan. Okay. So it was a long haul. But he always brought me down and uh, to see Ted once a year, whenever we could. And I'd never been on the field, you know, but the magnificence of the green impressed me. But when you're down there and there's nobody in the stands, you know, or even if the stands, and you're actually on that field, it, it's an experience. You know, here's a kid off a farm has never been more than practically a cow pasture for a ballpark. And now I walk into, of course, my first stadium was Yankee Stadium. And I'll tell you something, that was really something because, uh, you know, when you're, the biggest buildings I ever saw were silos. To walk into Tiger Stadium, you know, you're a kid, you've always listened to the games. And you never thought you'd ever be on that field to play Major League Baseball. And I think your dogs want to be into it. Dogs, what do you think? You want to get over and say something? I guess we should yeah. play a commercial. <laughs> well, well, about now. But anyway, you know, when you go to Tiger Stadium and, and even where you see now kids run around the bases, you know who really wants to be there, the kids, but the fathers get on the field. You know, that's a big deal to them. Yes. I would have been better off in another stadium. Um, Why do you say that? Because it's 440 feet in center field, and I, <laughs> I hit the ball straight away. I hit a lot like Carl Yastrzemski. Had I played in, um, in Boston or Wrigley Field or any field where it wasn't, you know, a, a, a cab ride to center field, I would lose at least 10 home runs a year in Detroit. What about the night that you guys won it with Don Worth single to right field in 1968? K-Line scored from third. The people went crazy. What do you remember about that night in Tiger Stadium? We went uh, uh, crazy in the locker room. You know, guys were flipping over in the whirlpool and, and throwing Mayo Smith. They put shaving cream on his head and threw him in there. It's the first time Jim Campbell and John Fetzer ever came in the locker room. Well, you threw Fetzer in there. Well, yeah. Well, I mean, everybody was fair game. I mean, we were having fun, and, and uh, he was the owner. And he, he, I think he really enjoyed it because I don't think he'd ever been around anything that was celebrated as much as that. And... and uh, uh, I think for John and, and Jim Campbell, it was a lifelong dream, although I'm sure Mr. Fetzer was thinking more in terms of his investment. But once he got his nose into it, uh, he was a baseball fan. And to win a World Series while he owned the club, or to get in a World Series, had to be a big thrill for him, as it was the players. And now the man who hatched this whole idea about Tiger Stadium, my friend, Erwin Cohen. Erwin, you know, you've seen the Tigers from three perspectives. Uh, first as a fan here in Detroit, and then as a newspaper man when you put out the baseball bulletin, and then finally working for the Tigers in their ticket office. And when I heard, when I heard that you had counted every seat in Tiger Stadium, I couldn't believe it. So I got to ask you, why did you do that, and what did you find out? In 1984, which was the first year I was with the Tigers, after the season, they went to a computerized ticket. So to get a schematic of every section, which I had, I had to account for each seat. So I physically had to count every single seat in the ballpark and every space in the bleachers. I found seven seats that weren't accounted for in the upper deck on the first base side, some of which were in the top row near the little gate where leading you to the third deck, those little exits or entrances if the elevators don't work. So naturally, the ushers knew about those seats but the ticket department never knew about it. Tickets were never printed for those seats because they never had an idea those seats existed. I saw my first game when I was 10 years old, and I never had any idea what the ballpark would look like because this is the days before we had a TV in 1950, and I thought it was like the playground ballpark, no grass in the infield. So I was shocked to hear, see the grass, and I thought I'd be hearing Harry Heilman announce the game. So I was pretty lost. I couldn't figure out when the game started, especially from left field. But luckily, my favorite player, Hoot Evers, was the left fielder. And he hit a ball off the left field fence right in front of me that Gus Zerniel misjudged. So that was my favorite memory of Tiger Stadium. Luckily, when I worked there, I had Frank Navin's old desk, and I was told it, it was his desk. To somebody else, it wouldn't mean anything, the old owner of the Tigers in the 30s. But to me, it did, because I consider myself somewhat of an historian and actually had his old chair and I've seen pictures of where he signed Ty Cobb to a contract with that desk and that chair. I used to write that I wish Dan Petrie, the former pitcher of the 1980s, could be my son. So speak up son. You're a guy from California. Sunshine, palm trees, beaches, Hollywood, the glamour life. 
yet you've chosen to live in Detroit and Michigan. Now, my question is that the fact that you played in this ballpark in front of these people in an industrial town, okay, which is hard and it's cold in the winter, the fact you played in Tiger Stadium, has that had anything to do with your decision to stay here and make your living and put your home, start your home here in Michigan, in Detroit, because I think it has. You know, you know me very, very well, Joe, because uh, I, w I got to thinking about what I was going to say, and that's exactly it. You stole a little bit of my thunder. I remember signing with the Tigers um, as a 17-year-old, and the only thing I knew was California and Hollywood, and you said beaches and palm trees and things like that. And when you sign, they give you a little program that has a picture with Tiger Stadium on it. And you, you look at it, and um, I'm used to Angel Stadium and Dodger Stadium. At that point, they were new ballparks. You know, they were sparkling and, and, and very nice and everything. And you look at Tiger Stadium, and it, it was the first symbol of, I guess, the Midwest and that traditional feeling. And it was the very first thing that, that I really saw, you know, okay, that's my goal, that's where I want to end up. And then actually achieving that goal and getting up here and, and, and seeing Tiger Stadium and being able to play there and getting close to the city and knowing really what the Midwest is all about. And I, I really think that I am a Michigander now. Um, I'm not going to badmouth California um, because it is where I was born and where I grew up. I, I should say not where I grew up, where I spent my childhood. This is where I grew up, and Tiger Stadium was the big part of it. I remember after night games, um, and this is my first lasting memory, of when the stadium was all quiet, everybody had gone home, and instead of walking through the concourse, I would walk again down through the tunnel, go to the dugout, and walk directly across the field and look up at the darkened stadium, the empty seats, and kind of think of, hey, here's a 20-year-old or 21-year-old California kid stuck in the middle of Michigan where, boy, I don't know if I could have told, pointed on a map to where Michigan was. And here I am and just, you know, I'm, I'm here in Michigan and I'm here at Tiger Stadium. And those are my, my fondest memories are when, you know, the seats are all empty. That Jackson Brown uh, song, Stay, I think is the name of it. Uh, when the seats are all empty, uh, let the roadies take the stage. You know, we just want to play and play and play. It was just a... Uh, those are my fondest memories of when the games were actually over. What was it like pitching in Detroit? We always hear about the overhang in right field, the short porch, and, and 92 miles to center field. And the, uh, it really is mu pretty much of a shooting gallery. It really is, even though it was 440 to center field. What did it feel like on the mound at Tiger Stadium? You know, I, I don't think there's a, a, a better playing surface in the American League than, than Tiger Stadium at, at this point. I think the infield and outfield, pitcher's mound, everything about that field is just ideal. But I, I remember learning early in my career that you had to pitch to center field because it was 440 feet. So um, down the lines, it does become a little bit more uh, uh, kind of a band box, and the ball really carries. But two things you did have going for you was – center field at 440 and also we used to call it you know Fenway has the green monster well we had the grass monster um, <laughs> we'd have Sparky let that infield grass grow very very long and it would certainly suck up a lot of ground balls that were destined for the outfield and with our infield back there with Lou and Tram up the middle you know they were able to gobble quite a, the, quite a few of those things up. No one we've spoken to has deeper feelings about our old ballpark than Dan Ewald the former publicity man of the Tigers. You've seen this ballpark from, from many ways, as a fan, right, as a kid, and then as a baseball writer, and then from the inside, something I never saw, okay, from the inside. What do you think the reason is that so many people care about this place? It's almost like it's like passed down from generation to generation, and there is a, a loving feeling about a ballpark, Tiger Stadium. Why is that? Part of it is the city itself. The city of Detroit was... It, at least generations ago, and I think to the present, you're born when you're born into Detroit, you're born a Tiger fan. It's almost like being born with a name. And I often look back at the ballpark and, and myself, and I still maintain I was the luckiest guy in the state of Michigan because I was born right down the street from the ballpark. And my grandfather was very good to me. It was my grandparents and my mom who raised me after my dad died. And... Um, Every Sunday afternoon for home games, uh, my, my grandfather was a blue-collar worker, but he always saved enough money where on Sunday afternoons we'd go to the ballpark. 
and those were the most glorious days of my life. We'd get there real early, and I'd try and catch foul balls that were hit into the stands, and, and I would count them. And over the years, I only got five, but that was five more than a lot of kids that I got. But my grandfather was very patient, and, and he would sit there and watch me uh, go for the baseballs. And we really didn't care who won the ball game. We pulled for the Tigers, but we just enjoyed it. It was just a, it was a place where you could come and you could celebrate being together. You wouldn't verbalize that, but you felt it. And there's a lot of feeling in that ballpark. And the beautiful thing about it is the fact that there are so many nooks and crannies to it and, and hidden treasures that once in a while a fan will discover one. After all the years I either covered teams there or went to the ball game as a kid, or work there, every year I'd find something new at that ballpark that I didn't know was there. And I think it was like a kid finding a, like a, a, a toy that he didn't know he had. And it, it was just a great feeling. Didn't you tell me that it was a, also a special feeling walking to the ballpark? How far away did you live? And I think you described to me one time about the sights of Michigan Avenue or wherever it was. The sights were great. I lived right off of Michigan Avenue and I lived approximately a mile from the ballpark. It was an easy walk. People walked back in those days. We had streetcars that ran right down the mi middle of Michigan Avenue and buses. But oftentimes uh, we'd walk. And when my grandfather wouldn't take me to the game, I'd go down there by myself. In those days, it didn't matter if a kid went down there by himself. And I'd sneak into the park a lot of times. You'd How? Get... How'd you sneak in? Okay. Come on. <laughs> All right. Back then, and I don't know if it's still being done today, but you had to p you'd look at for a group of people and you'd see like... Uh, a mother and a father and maybe six or seven kids and you kind of sneak up real close to them and as they were going through the turnstile you would try and get just a little bit in front of them and when you were a little bit in front of them you'd kind of point back to the uh, behind you so the ticket taker would think oh that's his dad he's gonna <laughs> give him the ticket and then once I got in there I used to run up those ramps as fast as I could and, and I'd hide out and and it was great um, but walking to the ballpark was uh, it was a treasure because Michigan Avenue back in those days, I'll tell you, it was a treasure chest of colors and smells and sounds and uh, sights. It was, it was beautiful because you'd pass so many different things on the way there. Back then in those days, like we have Eastern Market still today, there was a Western Market there. And Western Market was very similar to Eastern, except now it, it gave way to the, uh, to the freeway that cuts in there. Uh, and you had to walk past all of the uh, meat packing places. We call them slaughterhouses back then. And in the summertime, when they would slaughter those cows or pigs or whatever they were doing in there, that smell would come out. And you could, in, on a hot uh, summer day, it would just hang in the air there, and you could smell it. But when you, the, when you smelled that, you knew you were getting closer to the ballpark. Jim Hendricks, the radio man, is simply marvelous as he tells us about life as a kid working in Tiger Stadium after school. Jim, we've talked to a lot of people, but I don't think I've talked to the clubhouse boy. Now, I know you did this in the long ago, in the early 1950s, and uh, uh, what was that all about, Tiger Stadium? Tiger Stadium was a legend. Tiger Stadium was a draw. I can remember turning in two-cent bottles, paper drives, just to get a 60-cent bleacher ticket, have my mother pack a lunch, go down to that park at 11 in the morning, and those games didn't start till 3. I was hungry by game time. I love the ballpark. I love that stadium. And then I got a chance to be a clubhouse boy. I wrote to Steve O'Neill, and <laughs> he wrote me back and told me it was Neil Conway, or Lefty Conway. They were hiring the clubhouse kids, which were bad boys and ball boys. I went down, interviewed, left an application, went to work in the commissary. In other words, stocking buns and hot dogs around the stadium. That's what we call ourselves, bun runners. A bun runner? Well, a bun runner is we take all, the, they say, hey, we need 14 dozen buns up in the concession stand number 14 in left field, and you go down the commissary, load up that cart, and push it up those ramps. That was a bun runner, or hot dogs, or canisters of pop, whatever it took, we kept the concessions filled. And I got to see the ball game in between runs, Let's peek out one of those runways and take a look. And then one day, I went back that down to take my physical for a bun runner, as we call it, and I passed my physical, of course, to food, to be handle food. Went by the office, went one more time, walked in, said, hey, I'm still looking for a job. They said, come back Monday, this was a Friday, and we may have an opening. Well, I couldn't sleep the whole weekend. Got back there, got the job, couldn't believe it, was so enthralled. The next day was opening day, went to the convent, had to ask the Mother Superior for 16 half days off. And religion was one of the classes in the afternoon, and she gave it to me as long as I kept my studies up. That's the closest I came to kissing a nun. 
What was it like to, to be in that clubhouse, to see some of these great players walk in, and you're a kid? Yep, walking in and seeing Bob Filler, Joe DiMaggio, Dom DiMaggio, Jimmy Pearsall before he had his problems, and Casey Stengel, who used to swipe my cheese sandwiches and give me a uh, dollar for to go get some hot dogs. Running coffee for Joe DiMaggio. What a gentleman. And Ted Williams. Very temperamental man in that club, boss. He knew what he wanted. Told me one day, take my shoes out tomorrow in the morning, leave them out in the center field. I want the sun to hit them to soften the leather. I did, went out and went fishing, uh, went swimming rather, with Al Kaline, who was a rookie at that time. We're talking 1953. Storm came up, I thought, Ted Williams' shoes. I raced back to that ballpark, ran out in that center field, and just as I got those shoes, it started to pour. I could see me giving Ted Williams soggy shoes for that night game. Lance Parrish, catcher on the 84 champions, was the quiet man in the clubhouse of the Tigers, but he could always be counted on for an honest appraisal of his team. Lance, you were at the ball club uh, 77 to 86, and in one way, <laughs> you had the best view of all, right from home plate, you could see the whole ballpark. Tell me how you feel about what's happening. There is no ballpark quite like Tiger Stadium. And uh, I believe that it has to do with uh, the fact that uh, the stadium is so close to the playing field, that the upper decks are so close to the playing field, that uh, the atmosphere, uh, the electricity created by a full house, uh, I don't believe that you can get that same feeling in any other ballpark that, than you can in Tiger Stadium. Uh, there's just a certain feeling that, uh, that comes with the stadium being that close to you when you're playing on the field. And uh, uh, you go to some of these ballparks and they're so big and so spread out that uh, I wonder sometimes if people really feel like they're actually a part of what's going on at the stadium. Where I felt in Tiger Stadium that, that everybody had to feel like they were, they were a part of what was going on because so they, they were so close to the action. I remember uh, the first time I saw anybody hit a ball out of the stadium in a game, uh, Jason Thompson hit one over the roof. Uh, that was pretty spectacular and, and something that uh, I considered uh, a memorable event because I, you know, Jason in my mind, I, I grew up with Jason and, and always was in awe of how far he could hit a ball and to see him hit one out of the stadium in a game uh, was, was pretty exciting for me. You know, I'll tell you one of the things that I really remember is uh, uh, the way that the, the fans in the center field bleachers uh, always acted out there. It was always something going on. Uh, one of the first places that I ever saw the wave. Uh, and when you when you came to the ballpark, and especially in '84, when the fans were so much into the games, and they started doing their waves uh, frontwards and backwards and slow motion, and uh, it it was just unique to the game. I, you know, there were other stadiums that tried to do the wave, but nobody could do it like Tiger fans. Pitcher Frank Tanana was born in Detroit, and he'll be remembered for sealing the 1987 divisional title by beating Toronto one nothing on the final day of the season. Frank, of all the people I know, you probably are more aligned to Detroit than anybody. You grew up in Detroit, out by the Lanyo, Wyoming area. You saw this ballpark as a kid, and then later on, you certainly starred in this ballpark. First, tell me, what were your early impressions of, of, of Tiger Stadium? Well, uh, it was just, you know, of course, being a, a baseball player from a young age, my father being a baseball player too, Joe, um, whenever I had an opportunity to go there, I mean, it was just like, wow, you know, just an awesome place. I mean, this is where the, the big leaguers, my heroes, played ball, and wouldn't that be neat? You know, you'd think as a kid, wow, someday, someday. But, um, you know, it was just a matter of seeing the guys. I had a neighbor and my dad would take me to games. I had a neighbor took me to, we had front row, upper deck, right over the Tiger dugout, you know, seeing Mickey and, and Denny Pitch and Al and McAuliffe, Cash, Freehand, those guys um, just was an unbelievable experience for a kid who loved baseball uh, to see those guys and to be in that ballpark and to be, and as you know, those seats are tremendous seats. As close as you are to the field, you can literally shake hands with the guys as they come up. Even from the upper deck, you're so close. So that was phenomenal. And then one other wonderful experience was playing there for the Catholic League Championship back in 71 uh, with Catholic Central. Holy Redeemer beat us. But even that was a great thrill to play now on the field that, you know, the guys I admired and, and looked up to played on. 
And then, of course, to come into Tiger Stadium as an op opposition, having made the big leagues, to come in and pitch. Uh, remember pitching with the California Angels and, and stepping on that field for the first time was a great thrill. And, and then, of course, back in 85 when I got traded, uh, my very first experience in a Tiger uniform uh, to play in the, you know, famous – uh, ballpark Tiger Stadium as a Tiger realizing the dream come true you know who did who would have thought it you know who would have who would have dreamt that that would have happened but it was exciting then to even beat the Yankees uh, my very first start um, on a Saturday afternoon Sparky gave me the ball two days after I joined the team and shut out New York two to nothing pitched some other um, exciting ball games uh, remember um, my um, uh, a lot of strikeouts, winning my 200th game in Tiger Stadium, uh, beating Milwaukee for that. And then, of course, the, my kind of coup de grace, so to speak, was the uh, ball game against Toronto in 1987. Uh, we battled the Blue Jays all, all year, started out terrible, but then just kept winning and winning and winning and came down to the final game of the season, 1987, uh, pitching against Jimmy Key. Uh, if we win, we win our division. If we lose, we've got a playoff game. So we're one game up and was uh, fortunate enough. Larry Herndon hit a home run in the second inning, and I was able to complete, make that stand up, and we won the ball game one to nothing. Uh, Jimmy pitched a phenomenal game. I um, had, had did the same. Uh, for me at that time to go nine innings was unheard of. But uh, Spark kept kept the ball in my hand, and we ended up uh, winning that ball game, one to nothing. And that uh, that will always be my fondest uh, memory of of Tiger Stadium. And I've got a lot of them, but that that one game there will always stand out. Nobody worked harder than ex pitcher Jim Bunning to become a success in Tiger Stadium. Today he is a United States Senator from Kentucky. Senator. You know, I talked to Jack Morris, and he told me that he had to learn how to pitch because he pitched in Tiger Stadium. And I think you know exactly what he was saying. What did that ballpark do for you and your development into a major league pitcher? Well, Joe, it was the first major league park I pitched in, so uh, that has a special place for me. But even more than that, uh, when I played in Tiger Stadium, uh, Anywhere from left center to right center was an area you could pitch to. So if you, uh, the ball didn't carry as well as it does now. And uh, I could pitch uh, hard away or hard in and, and have some success uh, in, in left center and right center field. Only the super strong people could hit it over those fences. So I did have to learn how to pitch. Uh, Sometimes I disagreed with my manager occasionally. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, uh, my experiences in Tiger Stadium were 70% winning. You know, I won 70% of my starts there. They've had a young pitcher here, Jeff Weaver, and everybody says, well, here's another, another young Jim Bunning. Uh, he throws three quarters, a sidearm, whatever you want to call it. And, you know, and he really isn't because he doesn't go into the full wind-up the way you did. And he, didn't, he, didn't, he doesn't finish up the way you did. You know, I, I think of all the times you wound up either leaning on your, your pitching hand or your glove hand. And Jim, I can't remember that ever hurting you in the field. Did that ever, did that ever work oh, against I, you? I was, I was criticized, Joe, for not being able to field my position uh, as well, uh, particularly the ball hit to my right. But the fact of the matter, I got balls to my left that I would normally have gotten. What we did and what we'd worked out with our manager and with the pitching coach is to cheat well, by that, I mean to move our third baseman up because no right-handed hitters uh, pulled me really well. Uh, they were always given just a little bit, and so I didn't have people pulling the ball down the line so we could move our third baseman a little closer and to prote protect from that bunt. And I didn't have trouble with that. Only people who watch me fall on my glove and fall on my face half the time, they had trouble with it. You know, Jim, the day, I believe it was your rookie season, 56, when you struck out Ted Williams three times in Fenway Park, and nobody, nobody had ever seen that before. Well, it was the following year. It was uh, 57, when my, my first complete game in the big leagues, uh, after Jack Ty had put me in the bullpen for uh, a, a month, starting the season, he gave me a start in Fenway Park, and 
I did strike out Ted. I don't. I think he he thought my fastball was different than it was, or my slider was different because he took every third strike. He didn't swing at him, and so I suspected he didn't understand that the ball was running. Uh, the slider was running about four inches or five inches uh, in over the plate, and uh, I was able to get him. And the fourth time I was trying, but I didn't. He hit a nice soft five ball to Al Kaline in right field. Paul W. Smith, the voice of WJR, has a special feeling about what Tiger Stadium has meant to him. Paul, you were born in the early 1950s in Monroe, so I know I know you have a contact with Tiger Stadium. Oh, sure, Joe, I, I, I do. Any of us growing up in this area, and we remember all the great names. Really, for me, it would be like Al Kaline, Norm Cash, Willie Horton, Mickey Lowlitz. These are the names that come to mind. And, of course, you add to that Kirk Gibson and the bird, Mark the Bird Fitterich. But for me, my memory, maybe a little different than the other guys that you've talked to who were on the field of play, or in the case of some of them broadcasting the games, uh, my big moment didn't come back in the 50s or 60s or 70s. It was really in the 90s when I got the first opportunity to broadcast from Tiger Stadium and coming down and doing that right at home plate. That's when I got a rush of all of the history, the the Ty Cobb, the Hank Greenberg, the, the all of the personalities, the people who'd been for more than 100 years coming to the corner of Michigan and Trumbull. It, it, for me, that's what was very special. And to be able to see face-to-face for the first time, in many instances, Joe Falls or Pete Waldmeyer or Bob Talbert or Sonny Elliott or any of the television guys who I'd only seen on television, now I was seeing them in in person, in real life, and it was a, it was a, my most memorable moment because it struck me, I'm standing on home plate at Tiger Stadium, a place I never could have gotten to as an athlete. Was there a special game that, that you kind of recall over the years that you, you reflect back on that, that just has stayed in your mind? Always the home opener because it has been so significant to me because I've been able to be a part of it. And because it means it's the beginning, it's fresh, it's the start of the season for me. And so I'd say every home opener I've ever been able to be to, and, it, and there haven't been that many because I lived on the East Coast for so many years. What's your feeling then that the old place is coming down? I think the time is right. I think that the new park, Comerica Park, is going to be the best of the old and of the new. And I know that a lot of people are very upset because they have so many fond memories, but in the same way that the Hudson Building had great fond memories for me, uh, coming in there to see Santa Claus and things like that. Uh, those are memories that nobody's going to take away from us. Those memories are in our minds, not in the brick and mortar. And I will always have fond memories of Tiger Stadium, but I really look forward to the new ballpark. Over a thousand Tigers, from Al Labor to George Zuverink, have played ball at Michigan and Trumbull. Now, a new century means a new ballpark. But for those of us who have watched the game in Tiger Stadium, in the ballpark of our minds, we'll always hear the echoes of Tiger Stadium.